welcome to the to tonight's um pre meeting. I will go around and ask the council to sure. Two back. Uh, one. So I had a meeting with the Rocky Mountain Partnership, and they are a network of other networks. <laughs> they work with many city governments. They complement economic development departments. I think we have a few staff who meet with them regularly. Um, including many uh, but they would like to come in to give a study session on all the things that they do. They, um, they help a lot of cities with economic development, mobility, and they have a dashboard, a data dashboard that shows housing stats, homelessness stats. They pull everything together. Um, they work with Dr. Cog. They work with all sorts of groups, and they, I, I think, could be a cool view into what they do and how they can make a bus. They would like to get us to go to a, a round table that they're having as well. But yeah, it'd be more informational. Yeah, and so uh, we do have a uh, relationship with them and uh, the city a part of that organization. Um, I'm scheduled to meet with them in March. Um, and so um, what I would propose is what we meet with them in March and then see what we can uh, determine as a best way forward. Um, <laughs> our, our MGM is uh, data, which is awesome. Um, we all like our data. Um, and we'll see uh, kind of where we go with that information. Refresh my memory. How much is our taxes? But uh, yeah, I'm meeting with them in March, and so you know, uh, if I can start with them there, Jennifer and I'm I was just going to ask the staff a perspective on, on it before we decided uh, to it. Anyone else? The second oh, oh, I, I too met with them. Um, I knew them uh, uh, for the uh, director, which is uh, Ryan McCool from Burn Ridge Community College, who's done the as well as my chance. They, they've been talking about their uh, housing initiative that they've got coming up, and I asked them to route that through the city manager's office for any advice so everybody can see that. Okay. Number two ask is uh, so Highland Hills Parks and Rec uh, district. Came to my office hours, talked. Um, he would like to come in as well to talk about just information because we have so many ideas. Highland Hills, I think it would be nice to kind of see a map, see how we are involved, how the city gets involved with them, um, just get more information on our close relationship that we have with them and just let the people know. Yeah. I can check it out. I have not met them. So. Okay. So. Uh, and the hope is to simplify because there are so many different agreements. Our goal is to consolidate them and help simplify so that people understand all of the different um, ways that we work together. Okay. That's all. Uh, yes, last Monday was the uh, first. Uh, Rocky Flat Stewardship Council is its installation. Uh, uh, executive directors were all repeats because they all wished to come out and no one wanted to fight for those positions. Um, the meeting was virtual. Uh, the executive committee wanted to give that a try because, uh, especially some of the uh, residents that would like to participate, um, it, it you know worked out. They during the during COVID before people could participate. So, but there was an issue with some people using WebEx. So they went Zoom direction. And even though a lot of people do Zoom, um, that's a bigger group to have on Zoom. And so there were some bugs to get worked out on that on that part too. Uh, and so we, the biggest review was uh, the letter that uh, cities uh, asked to have sent out and we got Buy in from our congressional delegation to the EPA to ask them to do air quality testing to at least get the 
baseline. So especially concerned too if, if there's a uh, or when there's another fire on the property because there's been many other than you know, just wildland fires out there with the brush um, to see if there's uh, any exposure from that. But we need a baseline first. So uh, that's working through the process. Uh, no special permits and licensing meetings this week and uh, the Jeffco Economic Development Corporation meeting um, on Wednesday. Um, nothing on the agenda, so they canceled that. So that's anything else this last week. Uh, nothing much other than I brought it up in the strategic planning that the historic landmark board is looking to make uh, Union High School into a historic location in Westminster. And uh, they will be. Yeah, the chair of the board will be working with um, our staff and the school district in order to uh, try and get that designation in place. If that's the case, uh, I told them that there might be a, an MOU that might need to occur because um, right now it is on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, but our board would like it in Westminster's historic uh, preservation. And so uh, there might be some agreements that need to happen in that because um, I believe they're looking to replace the school is looking to replace the windows um, and the guise of our uh, conditions under our um, Westminster um, historic landmark board uh, they might have to go through the ins and outs of Westie and I don't know if they want to do that so um, just know that they're working on an agreement with them and it might come to us Roundtable. Oh, but 20 minutes getting to a doctor's appointment. Uh, it was very hot and uh, whacked on Channel 4 earlier. Uh, I, I would think there were at least 60 members of the public there for this one. There were about 20 meetings on fun. Uh, very frustrating. talked about lead what two out of three speakers spoke about the lead because that's the terrifying aspect of it for so many families that have children and they're uh of i mean they're frustrated to sum it up uh we've been doing this cnr for two two and a half years there's been nothing public that's seen done uh, we are changing the meetings to the first Thursday of each month at six to nine, six to eight at night. Uh, and they held an executive meeting. I did not go to the executive meetings because this executive meeting was about hiring uh, a contractor. This is what they want to spend the hundred thousand dollars on. Twelve thousand of them. And, uh, I've said to this group before. I think that the uh, CNR, because it has no legal standing, and because it has no authority whatsoever, it, it puts unreasonable expectations in the minds of well, the public. I think that's why the public is so unhappy. Um, right to participate, so I want to know what that's all going to entail because they're going to want to know if you want to participate. You never said for sure no to participation. Uh, well, I didn't go to the original meeting they had where they gave me the most information the meeting they had today. Like, uh, I Commissioner Stoltz didn't go to the executive meeting because she could actually told by her people that she shouldn't go to the second meeting because she couldn't go to the first meeting. Uh, we did have the FAA brief. Uh, the FAA brief I found tremendously disappointing. What did you find? It was a difficult situation because so many people wanted to talk, but 
they were on a hard 10 o'clock stop for them. So it was balancing that um, council member um, shop did that. I, I think he did a marvelous job keeping control of the meeting, trying to get questions ahead, letting the FAA talk, and then keeping the meeting open because he recognized how many people um, had taken the day off for gotten off work for a few hours so they could attend whatever I um, I and I know they sent answer questions to them so they weren't cold turkey so I think everybody did the best they could with the limited time they had right I would problem was what was the time they have so there were all kinds of questions from round table address at all they really didn't answer all the Send in questions by her, and only one of them came to her person. person. The other five were all uh, stuff like that. Some were from across the country. Oh, yeah, no, well, we're just ahead of uh, California sometimes on that. But uh, it's going to be a very difficult road to hope at the sea. I actually did listen to the whole meeting today until they cut to the executive session. Um, one of the things I'm curious about is I actually um, asked one of the other members, Kraft Tharp, Commissioner Kraft Tharp, because I'm curious. The FAA had mentioned that sometimes they participate. Um, I believe sometimes you can have a member of the FAA. That's what I understood them to say. So I was curious why we don't try to um, exercise that ability. To me, it seems like having a representative at the FAA, from the FAA and all the meetings makes sense to see where there are opportunities or where you could stop the rails. Passed today by basically that's what we could have. Them. Um, for me, I had two things this last week. On Friday, I had breakfast uh, with City Manager Freitag and Patrick Henderson from the Butterfly Pavilion. It was just really just um, for the two of them to get to know each other. Um, and as you know, they're in a capital campaign to try to build their capability. Um, I feel as a, a member of that board, they're doing fairly well in their capital campaign, I feel. Um, so I know we're having conversations about our agreement and some of the events for um, Manager Freitag and Patrick to get to know each other. Um, I know that their next meeting um, with staff, I believe it was in March, first week of March. Um, so it was a good record. Um, the other thing I had last week was a quick report. Um, they did not have a formal presentation last time. Um, I can share with them about their improvement on the water plant because that's a topic they've asked about quite a bit in the last year. So I thought it was important to make them apprised of their improvement. Um, I believe you were all provided from staff the findings about the um, tax revenue when it comes to menstrual products and diapers. Um, and so there were a couple of different recommendations that staff wanted to look at on there. I don't know that we're, or when we actually want to have a conversation about this, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose sight of the fact that this was brought to us. Um, that staff, whether or not that's something we want to have a formal discussion about. The other thing that they voted on as a board was about their safe space initiative. Um, they have a presentation that they would like to give to us. The board voted in favor of giving us that presentation. And so we would bring that forward to us and show them that presentation. And we'll see if we'll see that ask that the consent board plans on bringing forward with us. Um, besides that, it was just a few more questions around the chief search. I don't think it's something that I have to keep all that reminds me. Um, so that was to get their goals.
Um, for me, it was a trip to DC. Left at noonish, one o'clock on a Wednesday. Got in around seven thirty, and all day Thursday, that was our entire delegation. Um, there's twenty five of us total. It was the mayors from each of the cities, from us to Broomfield to Longmont and everything in between along the 36 corridor. Uh, county commissioners were with us. Staff member was with us. We had Department of Transportation. CDOT was with us. RTP was with us. Two RTP members were with us. I feel like I'm something, but it was a huge delegation that we fit into very few seats. Um, but the delegation, our representatives and they see us come from the Northwest Corridor um, and with the entire delegation, they know we're there for an ask, a big one, and um, they know that every person represented there supports what has been proposed. So that's how things have gotten done on this corridor from US 36 to now um, 119. They have, uh, I love what they're doing with the bike piece on uh, diagonal there. It will be a dedicated with um, lock borders, uh, cement borders, whatever you want to call it. They won't ever have to go over a road. So bicyclists will um, be able to ride that entire corridor. They will have a bus route set for express lanes and um, that whole community already has grants through Dr. Cog they have all but 25 million uh, ready to go. So that's the ask for the road plan, it's 25 million. They missed it by a burning pair last time. And uh, all they can say is our current delegation is going to write letters, Higginbotham Senate says that they will walk over anything we do. They will watch everything, keep in contact with the people that we I really left with, I, I think we're going to get two votes out of this one. So um, it isn't the elected that do it. We go and present, but it is our staff members, and they are invaluable. Um, I got to really know Karen from um, Boulder. She was just writing, I think, takes it from everybody and gets it ready, but I think she's a true writer for this proposal, and I saw her face. ounce of this proposal and this technical thing, they have listened uh, and um, I just believe that um, it was going to be great to see that picture and to get that done. Um, I just remind us that Longmont, um, because some people say, well, what does it matter to us? Um, we don't have any students there. Well, I'm sure we have people that live or work at IBM. I'm sure we have people that work Longmont or Boulder that take either Highway 7 or the diagonal. I certainly drive those. Uh, I can't believe I used to own one. So I just remember for the 12 years we worked on US 36, Longmont and those cities that are off to the northwest had not one inch of courtesy from the whole step, but they supported it. And that's what we have been doing. We have been a, a group since, uh, since Uh, 25 years and going back there for 20 years. So it is a, a strong group, it's a well known group. Um, what we didn't know was Governor Polis was there Wednesday advocating for what we were advocating for, and Tuesday, Thursday, we were just behind him, so we got it through. So that didn't hurt us because we're all sitting in front of the front page. Um, and then when we were going, um, we talked to Department of Transportation, we talked to um, uh, the station crew, the, the um, Amtrak, we actually talked to Amtrak folks. One of the Amtrak people that works back there lives in Highland um, down south. And so he knows all about Fast Tracks, he knows about everything that we're fighting for. 
and for the new passenger rail with Amtrak, um, the great news there is the hope that we have is that Amtrak has the relationship with BNSF to keep their jobs. Sea Daughter is no longer the same company that they were. That, uh, that, was, that was their arrangement in 2015. I don't know what the price is today. So uh, what Polis is going to do is they have that passenger um, it goes through the, the Northwest Corridor um, that we haven't gotten to Archie Field. And Archie Field will be doing that and the pink rail at the same time. And whatever things are found out through the pink rail can be used over here. So we're not wasting money. But the end product is trying to get a rail system that comes to the Northwest Rail that is going to that don't need a pass. So, um, that I think 16 years in, in those two days, and came home. I think I got home about 10:15 Friday night. Um, but again, it's staff that does it, and we have Deborah Baskett that does that for us. And um, I worked with her before when she actually worked with Louisville the last time I was around, and then in Louisville. But um, she knows our corridor inside and out. Works well with all of these other folks, and it is them that. So um, with that, I learned um, we have NADA and we have um, the, the Northwest Corridor, a mayor's and commissioners. We have the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners, which is also the new solution. We have NADA, the smart committee. We have members of both of those, but for some reason, we're not a um, because that group of people, that committee works with the Northwest um, Mayors and Commissioners and staff and makes all this stuff happen. So I don't, it doesn't matter why we're not there. I'm asking for at least four people to say that we can join that so we're back on track and Um, we wouldn't have the S66, and maybe we don't care, <laughs> but we wouldn't have our express lane um, if we worked on uh, the, the bus, different bus systems. We wouldn't have worked, um, we have transportation that we can. So there is help even with the rate grant for uh, 119. They're working on Highway 7 right now, 287. Making all the connections and making it work. That's not just cars, but different mobility. Parking fine 
selling a car parked on private property. I had assumed that to be about the spontaneous car lots that appear where people, one, one, one guy parks a car and then someone's going to want a search for his money. My question is, that's what I assumed. My question is directly, can an individual park his car labeled for sale on his own property? Yeah, that is entangled for the court and somewhat starred, shall we say, from the time of the court. That that would be the answer to that question. And it is the answer to that question. So a person with their own car for sale on their own driveway is fine. I will have to double check that. I, I don't I don't I don't I don't believe it's handled that way. That that is the answer to that to that question. Counsel, could you could you talk about this? This is not similar to parts of home that you can touch it easily like on your own property as opposed to my driveway. Now I'm not sure. I will I would have to look up. I don't want to we are, we are not we are not going to prevent a private person selling residence purchase for that property. I'd rather have it clearly defined. It says right here dealers are parking and sell on private property.
Welcome to tonight's meeting of February 13th, 2023. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd just like to welcome everybody to Westminster City Council meeting. We thank you for coming uh, and would like to remind all attendees that um, our meetings are subject to rules of decorum that are posted at the back of the room. We want to be sure all feel welcome and remind all that there is expectation that no attendee shall disrupt the meeting, that all threats and intimidation are prohibited. Signs and place cards are prohibited in council chambers and all attendees shall remain seated in their seats provided not in aisles nor shall the doorways be blocked. We ask that if you have a conversation to have, please take it outside. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Present. Councillor Emmons. Present. Councillor Azadi. Here. Mayor McNally. Here. Councillor Nermella. And Councillor Seymour. Here. I need a motion to excuse Councillor Nermella from tonight's meeting. Mayor so Pro Tem. You go ahead. You already said it. <laughs> Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to excuse Councillor Namella from tonight's meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That brings us to minutes of um, February 6th. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve the minutes of January 23rd, 2023 meeting and the minutes of the February 6th, 2023 special meeting as presented. Councillor Seymour. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass the minutes of January 23rd and February 6th. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That brings us to some special presentations tonight. Councillor Seymour. If I could have Cheryl Osborne and any family members she wants to bring up with her, please. <laughs> and I don't people it gives you cover. And I don't see a baton. <laughs> Welcome. Would you like to introduce those that came up here with you? Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a very special lady in Westminster lore. I think I could say that. Cheryl's been teaching baton twirling for 60 years here in Westminster. She, she's not that old. <laughs> Remember, you have to tell the truth. <laughs> we didn't swear you in. Um, Cheryl started coaching and teaching when she was 15 years old. Um, she was part of the uh, Broncos uh, twirling uh, program, the Bronquettes, and uh, she has been responsible for teaching, training, and developing for competition uh, many, many generations. Okay, the generation of baton tours. We, we won't overdo that, but you have seen her work at Westy Fest and other uh, 
presentations, the people up on stage twirling. And so she has really um, set Westminster apart because of her love and dedication. So we wanted to recognize you tonight. And I have a proclamation I'd like to read. <laughs> Whereas Cheryl Osborne has been helping children have fun, develop self confidence and improve their fitness, flexibility and hand eye coordination through the sport of baton twirling and Whereas Cheryl started teaching the baton when she was 15 years old, about the same time she became a twirler at Westminster High School. And whereas Cheryl went on to twirl for the Denver Broncos professional football team as a member of the Bronquettes during the 1959-60 season. And whereas Cheryl has coached hundreds of athletes and began coaching with the City of Westminster Park and Recreation Department in 1997. And whereas Cheryl continues to make a positive difference in the lives of young people to the sport of baton twirling and now therefore i nancy mcnally mayor of the city of westminster on behalf of the entire city council and staff do hereby proclaim appreciation to cheryl osborne for her 20 plus years of service with parks recreation libraries as well as many more years of making a positive difference in the lives of young people as dedicated as dedicated teacher in the sport of baton twirling and call upon the people of westminster to recognize cheryl as a devoted coach who has inspired youth in many ways that reach beyond the on twirling. Signed this 13th day of February, 2023, Nancy McNally, Mayor. And uh, a little gift bag to commemorate this for you. Thank you very much. Next is appreciation for our National School Resource Officer Appreciation Day. <laughs> this is Mike Wozniak. I'm down at Westminster Public Schools. Adam Roberts, also down at Westminster Public Schools. <laughs> Charles Gonzalez, I was well did not make that. Patrick Clark, third Public School. Thomas Steele, Jeffco Middle Schools. Kurt Brumble, Jeffco Junior High and Middle School. Stephanie Smith, Sergeant, Norm Hobart, here on the I can't say anything more than DC, but I can't say very well that these folks in our school are protecting our kids and providing safe environments. Thank you all for what you're doing for being here. Um, I, I will say a little bit more just because, like I said, I have uh, two teenagers right now who are in the school, <laughs> one adult child, and so she's at the middle school. And I know that these folks are hard times and good times that they're going through, whether it's just protecting the facilities from the threats outside of the facility, which um, over the last handful of years that I've been involved with, certainly there have been a number of times where the officers had to be more vigilant. Um, but it's also about building community with, with the kids and letting them know that. You know that they're there to help protect them, and so I think that it's really important. And I know that my kids very much appreciate what these folks do. So, with that I'm going to go ahead and read this proclamation. Whereas school resource officers are an integral part of our education system, building positive relationships 
the students through informal counseling, mentoring, public safety, education, and being designed to bring prevention and intervention into schools. And whereas school resource officers work to provide a safe and supportive school environment while working to support students in the classroom and after school events. And whereas school resource officers' mission is to provide a safe and healthy learning environment for children through cooperative efforts with school staff, students, parents, and guardians, along with our community. And whereas the goal of the school resource program is to reduce juvenile crime by helping students formulate an awareness of roles, authority, and justice while fostering positive relationship with law enforcement. And whereas school resource officers are a valuable and essential member of the education community who deserve respect and support from our public and in pursuing and keeping schools and students safe, and whereas this specialized role for police officers who have a true passion in making a positive impact on the community and the youth within the schools they serve. And now, therefore, I, Nancy McNally, Mayor of the City of Westminster, on behalf of the entire City Council staff, hereby proclaim National School Resource Officer Appreciation Day and call upon the people of Westminster to join in honoring the men and women who serve our school resource officers our school resource whose passion and keep our city and our community safe. On this date, we say the mayor of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank And Mayor Pro Tem, while you're up there, um, we next go to presentation of Employee Service Award. Bob Krugmeyer, come on down. Bob uh, started his career with the city in January of 1998 and is currently water resources engineer with the Water Resources and Quality Group. Bob spends a large part of his time tracking Westminster's daily water, uh, raw water operations, along with the rest of the Water Resources and Quality team, works hard to ensure that the precious resource is maximized and protected. Bob also sits on the boards for several ditch companies where his field experience is put to good use as a hands-on member, keep, helping keep these vital waterways in peak operational shape. In his spare time, Bob continues to volunteer with several animal rescue organizations, sits on the, sits on the Colorado Beagle Rescue Board of Directors, I need a couple of those little critters, runs a small photography business that provides free digital imaging services to several local nonprofits and teaches photography classes at the Butterfly Pavilion. Bob has also expanded his teaching credentials by working with STEM schools over the past few years, and it helps to bring his work experience to the next generation of engineers and scientists. I know him so well as both a photographer and as the rescue king. <laughs> he has four-legged fur friends that um, most people wouldn't take in, and you do, and love them as your own, and make them happy until their end days. So you're a special person. Certificate. Most importantly, a 25 year gift of $2,500. Not 
not to go for cruiser. <laughs> Councillor Nermella was to present the 30-year award in pin, uh, but she's out tonight, and I have the honor of presenting to Dan Bradford. So if Dan is here, could he join me? Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Well, Dan is being humble. He has been with the city for 30 years. Uh, he was hired in January of 1993 as a general building inspector for the building division of community development. He came to the city from the general contracting uh, construction tr trade. Through education, classes, training, and testing, Dan has received international code certifications for residential and commercial building inspectors, residential and commercial plumbing inspectors, and a residential and commercial mechanical inspector. Did you say you're a jack of all trades? Dan has worked diligently at his craft over the past 30 years to become one of the premier combination building inspectors in the state. His dependability, faithfulness, and commitment to his trade make him a huge asset to the building division, community development, and to the city of Westminster. Dan and his wife, Susan, have been married for 23 years. They have four, four children, Ashley, Hope, and twin boys, Carly and Denver. The <laughs> family enjoys spending time in the outdoors, which includes hunting and fishing. All of the kids are now grown and out of the house. Dan has two grandchildren, Aiden and Aria. Dan and Susan in the past enjoyed taking long distance trips on their Harley, but they are now enjoying taking trips in a small travel trailer. Although that is fun, Dan still enjoys the need to be in tight corners, so he has learned how to fly airplanes. This is quite an expensive hobby, so he now reads aviation manuals, screams about flying, and hopes to hit a small lottery so he can fly. <laughs> That brings us to public comment. City Clerk Fitch, do we have anybody? We do. The first person signed up is Jared Malias. I apologize. Welcome. Thank you, Melius. You were really Melius. close. Uh, Mayor McNally, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members, thank you for allowing me this chance. I really apologize for burdening the council with this matter, which is, I think, minor. I just didn't have um, any other options that I could think of at this point. Um, I'm here to make a request of you, and the request is basically this. Um, I'm requesting permission uh, to operate under the notice requirements uh, that existed when I began the process of my development um, about a year ago now. A little bit of background on that. About a year ago, um, I began submitting documents to, to create a subdivision of my 2.6 acre plot of ground in Westminster um, from one lot just to two lots. So a simple, not, a, not an apartment, just a, just a, a small subdivision with an, another house for me and my family. I, have a, I just have a large family. I have nine kids. Um, so we wanted to build a little bit bigger house. That's the only thing. So no, no major massive apartment. I'm not a great big developer or anything like that. About four months ago, the city council extended the requirements for noticing, as you remember, uh, 
um, from I think three and then to 500 feet and then to 1,000 feet and then not just um, not just landowners but residents as well. Um, I learned about that added requirement about three weeks ago. <laughs> um, it's not a big deal, it wouldn't seem, but for me that went from noticing about, I think 75 or 100 residents to 1,200 residents in my case. Um, the reason is because um, I live just close enough to here on street and across that major, major road is a bunch of, uh, is the Orchard Park uh, Town Center with a ton of apartment, brand new apartment buildings over there. Um, that brings the cost, which I expected uh, from around a couple hundred dollars, I think not a big deal. The estimates of 5,000 plus, um, and I still have to pay postage, at first class postage for 1,200 times two. So that's notice for the, the planning division or the planning commission, which meets in a, about 15 days when I'm scheduled to appear. And then city council in about, uh, six weeks or so. Um, I'm not a big developer. This is a major expense um, for my family. It's house payments, plural, for us. So I do not have deep pockets, um, especially since this is not a big development. It's just a, a, a fairly minor um, project. So I would ask if you have the ability, and I apologize. I, I don't. I don't expect you to act on this. I know that's an unusual request. Council can't just be making actions like this um, and making exceptions is, is challenging. But I, um, if, if you do have the ability to issue this exception, um, I think the planning department would, would go along with that. And I would very much appreciate it. Um, I think that that's all that I have. Thank you so much. Questions at the end. Thanks. Um, uh, City Manager Freitag. Yes, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, um, Sir. Uh, Welcome, you know, by the way. <laughs> thank you. It's good to be here. Um, we did see your email to the council earlier today um, and have spoken with the city attorney and the community development director. Um, and we both, uh, all three of us, um, agreed that using the terms um, from when you made your application would certainly be appropriate in this matter. And so I think that your request is supportable um, for the community. I'd ask the attorney if the attorney has any uh, legal expertise that he wants to speak to here. Uh, thank you, Manager Freitag. I'm glad to meet with the planning manager and uh, Deputy City Attorney Graham to talk about next steps and how applying the standards that were in effect at the time of the application uh, might work. So just ask for the opportunity to have that follow up after tonight. And my question is, do you need any blessings from us to do that or just let them have a conversation and you come back to us or? Mayor, I think what we can do is, is um, you know, let the experts have that conversation and I can just follow up um, with the council as to as to which way is the appropriate way to go. But certainly seems reasonable at this point. I can empathize with uh, um, the volume and the cost. So we get that. Okay. I, I, if I could add one thing, Mayor is the first chance I was able to come here. I need to send these letters this week to comply with the noticing requirements. So this is sort of my shot. Uh, you know, and I don't know if this can, if it could be done that, that quickly. Uh, again, I recognize the challenge. So I just appreciate any effort you could make. Thanks. Our next speaker is Chris Stimson. Welcome. I'm having trouble hearing you. Make sure you bring the microphone close to your. How's that? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. They're all going out to party. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Councillors uh, and staff, uh, it has come to my attention that there are people in Westminster, some of them in the room tonight, even on the podium, who object to the notion of neighbouring communities wanting to restrict the number and types of firearms that can be bought. 
Generally, such people like to cite the Second Amendment to the US Constitution to justify and defend their views, even at a time when there have been more mass shootings than days so far in 2023. And I find that when the Second Amendment argument is raised, it's either by people who don't understand it or by people who do and hope the rest of us don't. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. Let's remember that in 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified, many of the founding fathers, in particular Madison and Hamilton, if memory serves, found the concept of standing armies ab abhorrent, considering their only role to be the oppression of the people. Given that the new country had only recently emerged from a wide-ranging war against the standing army of another country, this was understandable. Uh, for national defense, however, an armed body, body was considered essential. Thus, the solution of a citizen army only activated in time of war was embodied in the Constitution. So at the time of writing, the meaning and intent of the Second Amendment was quite clear. It contained no language implying that the people should be able to carry their arms with them in public in peacetime or discharge them in crowded places. It was written and ratified purely to enable the establishment of a citizen army, a body that evolved rather naturally to the National Guard. Now, there are two ways of viewing the US Constitution, either as an originalist or as a living constitutionalist. An originalist considers that all statements in the document must be interpreted based on the original understanding, quote, at the time it was adopted. Thus, if you're an originalist, you cannot possibly approve of today's conditions in which, one, private ownership of firearms wildly exceeds in volume the need for which the Constitution approved it. Two, of an official militia is satisfied by the National Guard. Three, people of questionable mental capacity can own firearms and use them against innocent bystanders. Four, ad hoc groups with violent and anti-democratic motives can form unofficial militias for purposes of domestic terrorism. And five, in which 20,000 Americans die of gun violence each year. None of this, all too common today, is what the founding fathers meant by the Second Amendment. A living constitutionalist, on the other hand, considers that the Constitution should be interpreted in the context of current times, even if such interpretation is different from original interpretations. Such a, a believer has even less grounds today to agree with the NRA's all-encompassing view of the Second Amendment. Security of our free state today is provided by the largest armed organization the world has ever seen, the US Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and Navy, as well as the National Guard all a logical evolutionary interpretation of that well-regulated militia of 1791. Thus, any living constitutionalist gun owner today citing the Constitution as rationale for his or her deadly possessions should be prepared to report in uniform to a government facility for a severe haircut and training in the military arts. If they're not so prepared, such persons are not part of today's interpretation of the well-regulated militia they're not necessary to the security of the free state, and therefore they don't have the right to keep and bear arms. So while it's easy to open one's mouth in a discussion and utter the phrase Second Amendment as if it's an airtight closing argument, no under to understand what that phrase means is to understand that it is not licensed for a personal armory of firearms. And if a local authority wishes to constrain the effect of such personal armories, it is entirely within their ambit to do so. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is John Palmer. Welcome. John Palmer, resident of Westminster. A couple of things I'd like to bring forward tonight. First, on your public hearing under 10B regarding the parking violations, Councillor Baker brought up a very good point in the pre meeting. I think that needs to be clarified. Along with, I also believe there should be language in there where it talks about construction equipment should also include farm equipment. Because that, that seems to be a problem too, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. So I, I would appreciate that that get cleared up. Next, uh, didn't have a chance today to go online and see if our new water porthole was available to use. Was it? Can anybody answer me? 
This is your time to talk to us. Well, I, I'm asking, weren't we told last, last week that that would come live today? Although it be short of what we originally promised by the city and that we would have real time monitoring and be able to access real time monitoring instead of it taking 24 hours to upload. That, that's not what we were guaranteed and promised two years ago, two and a half years ago when this all came to fruition. So if it did come online today, I don't know. I didn't have a chance to look, but I, I was just curious if it did, does it work or is it gonna crash like about every other web page in the city? Again, I asked, did it come up live today? Somebody here should know, I believe. It's supposed to come up tomorrow. We'll check it out tomorrow. But again, I, I still confess that it wasn't what we were promised in real time monitoring. 24 hours out doesn't do any good when it contains, comes to a leak or excessive water use. It was sold to us that you could go online and figure out exactly, you know, today at two o'clock there was a water problem. I used X number of gallons, figure out why instead of being a day late. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last speaker I had signed up. Thank you. Is there anyone that didn't get signed up that wants to speak? That brings us to city manager's report. City manager Freitag. Good evening, uh, city council, mayor, mayor pro tem, councilors, um, certainly to our uh, community members that are in attendance, anybody that might be watching online. Um, before I get going with the city update, did want to introduced uh, both to the council and um, to our community, our uh, brand new HR director, Davey Godfrey, if you could stand up. Uh, <laughs> Davey joins us from the city of Marietta, Georgia, um, where he served for uh, seven years, seven years, and uh, prior to that, a career in the Army. And so we're glad to have him join the city team. Today is day one, and it's uh, an exciting ride moving forward. All right, so welcome, Davey. Welcome. And so with the city update, I um, wanted to highlight a couple things. First of all, Parks, Recreation and Libraries is hosting a job fair um, that's scheduled for Saturday, February 25th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at City Park Recreation Center. Um, we're excited for um, folks that might be interested in applying for um, seasonal jobs, full-time jobs, part-time jobs, lots of opportunities out there. They'll be able to apply and interview on site. And the website uh, is our city website slash jobs encourage folks to come out and participate um, next bullet uh, towards the bottom is um, something that I think is a great initiative from our community development department um, and uh, you know since my arrival here I've been talking to our city leadership team specifically about um, communication and engaging the community and being receptive and responsive um, and certainly accessible uh, and uh, our community development department uh, took a look at their operations and their organization and said we can build a customer um, uh, and communications engagement uh, um, organization internal, no new resources, just reorganizing how they currently do operation. They're calling it the development services team. And that team will be responsible for any contact that comes into the department, managing the distribution of the work out to you know, various divisions in the department and then back to that department for engagement with um, the community. And so um, kudos to uh, uh, Department Director Downing for coming up with that program, that idea, we're excited about it. Um, and we'll see whether other opportunities we have to spread that out across our city, but a great initiative by community development. Um, just for the community's sake, if you need to contact the community development uh, department, you can certainly go to our city website slash community development or call them at 303-658-2114. Next slide. Uh, Westy Wynn, uh, and we wanted the highlight um, the city volunteers that help this city serve this community. And that is we've had city volunteers that donate over 20,000 hours of service last year. So in the city workforce, we have 1,100 city employees. We have approximately 118,000 residents. And there is no way that 1,100 city employees are going to serve a community of 118,000 people. We need help. And so we certainly appreciate 
folks in the community who come out to volunteer and to assist in delivery of services across our community. Um, and so they recorded those 20,243.65 hours of service in 2022. If you wanna put a dollar figure on that, that's over $600,000. Um, towards the community uh, and uh, you know just a, a testament to the spirit of volunteerism in the community. Um, we had 1130 new volunteers this past year and they partnered with over 2000 previous volunteers to make a difference serve in our community and I think it's a testament to that spirit of volunteerism and uh, sense of community that we all have here in Westminster. Um, if you're interested in learning more about being a volunteer in our community if you go to our city website slash volunteer Westminster, you can learn more. And so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, next slide. Things to know, planning commission meeting Tuesday, uh, tomorrow evening, seven to 9 p.m. right here in city council chambers. Special permits and license board meeting is Wednesday, seven to 8.30 p.m. here in council chambers. Um, our library continues the one book Westminster discussion, Woman of Light um, with state historian for Colorado, Dr. Nikki Gonzalez, and that's Saturday, February 18th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. at College Hill Library. Um, reminder to everybody that uh, Monday is President's Day holiday, and so city administrative offices are closed in observance of the holiday, um, and uh, emergency uh, personnel and those that um, need to keep working to keep the city doing what we do um, will certainly be uh, uh, working that day. But uh, um, the administrative services and offices will be closed. Uh, Environmental Advisory Board is Wednesday, February 22nd, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, and that's upstairs in the City Manager Office Conference Room. And then our next City Council meeting is Monday, February 27th, 6.30 uh, here in Council Chambers. Next slide. Um, one item that is included in the uh, packet of information for the uh, Council this evening is an information only item and that uh, deals with the transfer of excess property from the Department of Defense to the Westminster Police Department. Happy to answer any questions that there may be on that. Next slide. And as always, I encourage you to give us a, a call, contact us. We certainly uh, want to be accessible. We want to be responsive. We certainly want to be transparent um, and certainly accountable for what we do. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, you can certainly do that by calling 303-658-2006. You can email me directly at mfrytag at cityofwestminster.us. And you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, check us out on Instagram, and you can ring our bell at next door. Any questions, that's all I have this evening. Any questions? Thank you. City Council comments. Councilor Baker. Really, thank you, Mayor. Uh, really introspection can be an enlightening process. I mean, a reminder to engage in really intro introspection should always be taken seriously, especially following an acrimonious conversation. Among this council's six guiding principles is, okay, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which which we define as achieving an equitable process for the people of Westminster by, okay, providing opportunity for all voices to be heard and drawing upon, and drawing upon community diversity in really decision-making. This is a good and ambitious goal. It's very, very hard to do. Most people want to hear other people appreciate and praise their work and ideas. We live in a culture that expects praise and really congratulations for almost any accomplishment, no matter how small. It's a kind of groupthink. In many ways, I mean, the demand for praise and really exaltation from, from like observers is so out of proportion with, with really any accomplishment, it becomes ridiculous. Because, because my children played in youth sports leagues, I saw many examples of this behavior. And soon, well, the coach became the only source to point out the flaws in a player's actions. 
and really with only one source of really criticism of an individual's play, time, timely opportunities for that player's improvement shrank. And this group think this, I mean, the support for my team, regardless of the flat facts, works in really opposite ways too. We have, we have all seen this conduct everywhere, including at the highest levels of really professional sports. I mean, the number of times I have seen opposing players in a game give really hand signals that are really different than, well, the referee's call is really beyond my ability to count. And we have, and we have all seen, I mean, the political conversations where, where the audience interrupts, well, the process with either condemnation or really adoration. This really culture of okay support for my side, my team, my ideas is ingrained and practiced in American culture. It is why this council's goal of really diversity, equity and inclusion is both admirable and ambitious. And while our goal of really, and while our goal of okay, diversity equity and and inclusion is really difficult it is not impossible but it does require several very expensive really commitments number one we must give up the automatic revulsion of different ideas it is really difficult to include other voices in our group when really they do not share our really biases. Number two, we must, we must give up our time and we must become curious. This is the most expensive cost of our guiding principles because for our time, once spent, it is lost forever. Number three, we must give up our real arrogance and basically accept the possibilities that our plans could be improved or they may even be in error. Number four, we must give up the easy answer of excluding the objecting voice. Exclusion is a charming way to avoid really conflict, but it's not what our goal is. And number five, we must have thick skin. Overcoming our immediate emotions to hear what is being said takes a lot of self-control. And our council wants to do this. These are our principles and every member of this council has spent lots of money and lots of time to be here and bring these principles to life. And our council has repeatedly brought this guiding principle of really diversity, equity, and inclusion to life. Well, I mean, the first instance I remember is this council speaking up for, I mean, the minority point of view during the COVID mask controversy. This council supported our, our residents in really resisting the, the oppressive, destructive, and fear-laden mandates of our state and county governments we're trying to impose. And did this council take this, of the con take this con controversial action based on really scientific knowledge? No, none of us are trained, experienced virologists or you know, researchers. None of us are really epidemiologists. None of us are medical doctors or public health experts. So what advantages did council have that allowed us to take this really minority stance? We could see the whole picture and the cost to our, of the citizens that all the COVID experts and are of, I mean, the political superiors could not 
or would not see. We had common sense. We saw the really unexplained incong incong incongruities in the official narratives and in real life results. We heard the cries for help and the stories of harm that were endured by really businesses and individuals. These were, I mean, the stories that were of the dismissed by the COVID experts. No cost paid by others was really too much for the COVID experts and no story of harm would change their minds. No new facts that cast doubt on their of the previous pronouncements would be examined. And the COVID experts had too much prestige to lose. It is said that in hindsight, it is said that hindsight is 2020. But even today, the COVID experts will not accept that they made any errors. This council challenged political of the correctness and really political power to choose to really support the fairest and best path for Westminster, regardless of, I mean, the resentment it cost to our council. And then there was, well, the proclamation on gun violence. I mean, a rem I mean, a minority of council had a recommended version of a really proclamation they wanted to advance. And instead of excluding the idea, which, have been, which would have been so much easier and efficient, this council painstakingly forged a statement that all members could agree on. It took eight tries. Version eight, America's losses to gun deaths were given the importance and urgency they really deserve without really vilifying gun owners and really recognizing the enormous cost imposed on gun owners. As most observers of Westminster know, there are two passionately burning issues before this council. Well, the future of the new downtown and the future of our water treatment plants. I implore my colleagues to be curious and patient and have thick skins. This council must, this council must hear the facts and follow up on the facts and include overlooked facts and then put that information into proportion. I implore my colleagues not to handle these topics like it was a battle in which to claim victory, but let it be an exploration to understand the obstacles and objections and opportunities so we can arrive at the best choice for the future of Westminster. And really decisions made by council today will be the obligations of the people who live here today and well, the inheritance of the people that will live here in years to come. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. First, um, thank you to everybody who showed up tonight. Um, next, I want to remind folks that next Tuesday is my policy in Pilsner, which is an opportunity for the public to come and enjoy Cocopelli Beer Company, which is where we host at, at 6.30 to 8.30. Great local business. You can come have a pint with me and <laughs> talk about whatever you want to talk about. There's usually a handful of community members there, and I always appreciate um, a wide view of different topics that we cover with different um, perspectives on them. Um, I think the conversation that we've just heard here tonight needs at least a little bit addressing, and I think it's timely. Um, it said that your liberty to swing your fist ends at another person's nose. And so I do think that your liberty to talk, your liberty to live your life the way you want is something that this council values. Um, I think conversation is something that this council values. Um, I think it's time to have a conversation about things like youth sports when we just had our SROs here. One of the things that's most valuable to me about a program like that is it's directing youth when they make a bad decision. Um, we've all, well, if you've ever attended or played youth sports, you've seen the parents that maybe take it a little too serious. They think their kid's going to be the next MVP in the NFL. Um, that, to me, isn't positive. However, pointing out a child's mistakes 
so that they can grow from them or an adult is a positive. Um, I certainly ascribe to that, but there is a way in which you do do things. Um, conversation does happen in, in every topic that we have had. Uh, one most recent that there's been some discussion between council members is the choice on what we've done with the water plant and what we're gonna do to move forward. That discussion has had hundreds of hours of discussion just by the council that sits here today, not including the hundreds of hours that that topic has had in the last five years. <clears throat> so when council members don't get their perspective as the path forward and they start with name calling, be it of this council or be it of staff, you lose your ability for me to listen to you because I do not owe anyone the right to be heard from me. If you want to have a conversation civilly, I will always have that conversation. But when we get into calling either council members or staff um, names, saying things like uh, criminal or saying things like uh, dishonesty, if we don't have proof, that conversation ends with me. So I, I do think that this council takes all the things that were mentioned here seriously. We do have serious conversations. We'll continue to have serious conversations, but it needs to be done so civilly. I don't think that that is outside of the agreement that this council has is how to we will operate with each other. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the top of the organization. We have a responsibility to shield the people who work from this place to have a safe working environment. Um, I take that very seriously. And so I hope that moving forward, we can continue to be constructive and have good conversations around the topics that are important to this whole community. Anyone else? Councillor Seymour, it was hidden. I didn't see it. Sorry. Oop, lost my sock. Uh, no, just a quick update. Um, this was a late notice on uh, Manager Freitag's report. Uh, special permits and licensing um, uh, has canceled. So uh, nothing on the agenda. So if you were going to attend that, uh, um, don't show up on Wednesday. <laughs> Anyone else? I shared with uh, council prior to coming in to this meeting. Um, last week, I represented the city with all the Northwest mayors and commissioners that are from uh, US 36 to the north and to the west. Every mayor was there, the staff member. We had CDOT, RTD. Uh, we had the new passenger rail um, CEO that is working with them. We had um, see uh, RTD with us. We had two RTD members with us. Um, it was a, a coalition of about 25 members. We went to every one of our House and uh, Senate representatives to pitch our pitch to them. Um, we are going for a raise grant uh, along the diagonal. They have raised uh, 150 million. They need this last 25 to finish the project and get going. Uh, they missed it by a rabbit's hair last time. So they went and talked to people that read those um, proposals and know that there's some technical pieces that uh, they'll feel more comfortable if those are in this raise grant. So they have tweaked everything. Uh, they are looking it over, and it is staff that does that. We make the pitch as electeds, but it is staff that works tirelessly to put those things together. Um, I believe they're going to bring home a win for that this corridor. And I know we have people that work uh, at IBM and, and drive uh, Highway 19. Also, uh, there's a study going on for Highway 7. Um, the northwest piece of it is from Boulder and goes up until the NADA group starts with it from their point to Brighton. So it is truly an entire corridor that we are, uh, we belong to each of those groups. And so we work together. Uh, I know the senators and representatives said, uh, as they tried to squeeze it in all 25 of us in a room to talk to them about these projects, um, when we come together with one voice that massively, um, it makes their job easy because they don't have to decide, well, is it this city or this city or this city? When they see us, all the cities working together for big regional projects, um, it just makes it easier for them to go on our behalf to their colleagues and say, this is why. Um, 
it should happen. So fingers crossed, uh, we'll know in a few months, but that's where I was this last week uh, on Thursday uh, and Friday. All right, consent agenda, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mary. Move to adopt consent agenda item 8A. Uh, Councilor Evans. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve item 8A. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councilor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item 10A, Councilor's Bill number three. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill number three on first reading, adding a new chapter to the Westminster Municipal Code, code um, to Title 13, designating trees as critical green infrastructure. Second. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill number three. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Baker. Yeah, uh, I'd like to find out about approximately how many trees are in the city and approximately how much water does it take to have each tree survive, knowing that that's a sliding scale from whether it's a big tree or a small tree, but there must be some kind of rule of thumb that we can apply. Mayor, we got city forester here that can respond to that. Welcome. Uh, I thought really CSU had had a formula for like existing trees and again based on diameter or circumference because that's the same thing really it's just a math problem and so many gallons per month and stuff like that. There, it, there's so many variables in each tree depending on the location and what that and also a tree's drought tolerance. Okay, and of those trees, uh, 500,000, that's more than I thought, uh, 30,000 of them are owned by the city and the others are owned by privates? It's a little more complicated. So, um, yes, about 500,000 in the city altogether. We have 14,000 approximately inventory trees that we have to create of our uh, medium parts that we have. Our open space trees. Okay, so it is about 30,000 city trees and, right. and be 450,000 privately owned. Thank you. Councillor Emmons. Thank you. In an email uh, to staff, I had questioned, um, don't get me wrong, I like tree infrastructure and, um, and the ordinance around it. I just need to better understand. Um, what I didn't want to have happen is why now, um, since we've had trees in Westminster for decades. Uh, and then two, what I didn't want to have happen is um, someone who has a private um, ownership of a tree, whatever they want to do with it become lawful because we have this ordinance now. And so that's what I'm trying to avoid here and wanted to better understand a little bit more in depth as far as why now and what are the specifics? I know that the, the um, staff report said that this is to help grant funding, but we've never needed it. And in your in staff's answer, it said you don't presume that it would um, make us not receive it. So I'm just trying to understand the ins and outs of why we're moving this forward. Completely do. That's never happened. We've never had federal funding to support a restored tree. Um, 
So those two things, in fact, it's somewhat fortuitous for us to have those two link because in the Midwest and East Coast, where EV would have come through, all of that EV response fell primarily on local governments. So now we have an opportunity to bring in some of the So, you know, address EAD either through, you know, our response to EAD or our canopy recovery. So that's pretty much the timing. And those funds and grant opportunities from that act are, are set to be released within the next two weeks. Okay. Okay. I think that answers my questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mayor. Oh, city manager. No. Anyone else? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item B, uh, resolution number four. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, mm -hmm. Mayor, before I read this, does mm -hmm. the city manager have any update on what we asked about? Uh, thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, city Attorney Dave Frankel. Uh, yes, the underlying code section, which uh, City Council approved back in January, um, excuse me, <clears throat> at 10.1.2, excuse me, 10.1.12 C5, which addresses uh, the parking vehicles for sale on private property as an exception, and it provides that a property owner may display one vehicle per residential dwelling unit with a for sale sign or a for lease sign listing the owner's address in the driveway of their residence. So there is an exception. I, my understanding is the provision is intended to address, as you indicated, pop-up used car lots that are on vacant lots, but not to impact a, an owner of a vehicle selling it on his, his or her own property. Um, with that, then I would move to adopt resolution number four, setting fine amounts for parking violations in the city of Westminster. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to um, pass resolution number four. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Rizzotti. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I will be voting no on this. Um, I wanted to give my explanation as to why. So as we all know, um, we need to validate the concerns of all parts of our community. Our residents are suffering. Uh, that's our working class, middle class, small businesses in an economic downturn that we still have not come out of from a, a pandemic. Folks are working multiple jobs. Cost of living is out of control. So people can't afford housing. They can't afford rent. They can't afford childcare, gas, energy, groceries. I think the last thing we should be doing is um, enforcing and implementing a set of fees and fines on parking, which historically has inequitable consequences for some of our community. Um, I, I would ask for either a one year moratorium on these fees or altogether we just reimagine how we do this. We can make it proportional to people's income. Um, we can make it so it's more of a process towards high demand areas versus, versus a blanket all fee um, with rising escalations. If you look at the fee schedule, I don't think this is the right time to be doing this. And that's why I'd be voting no. Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll be voting yes on this, especially since we got a clarification on sales on uh, of the landowners itself that's, that's in the code now. But uh, it's it's a, a transferring of what we currently have on the books um, over to our parking enforcement group. And so these are in existence now. Uh, it's just part of the process that we've we've talked about as far as allowing uh, police to do policing work and, and in this case, uh, parking uh, violations under a separate group. So I will be voting in favor. Anyone else? Roll call, please. Councillor Emma. Yes. Councilor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 5 1 vote. That brings us to item C. Um, C1 is moved to adopt resolution number five. I don't know who came first. Councilor Emmons. 
I move to adopt resolution number five, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Adams County Open Space for the Squires Park renovation project. Councilor, or, uh, <laughs> Councilor Seymour? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass. Adopt resolution number five. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Azadi? Yes. Mayor McNally? Yes. Councilor Seymour? Yes. Councilor Baker? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott? Yes. And Councilor Emmons? Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item C2. Move to adopt resolution number six. Councilor Emmons? I move to adopt resolution number six, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Adams County Open Space for McKay Lake Area Management Plan Implementation Project. Councilor Seymour? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution number six. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor McNally? Yes. Councilor Seymour? Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Dema. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. And Councilor Azadi. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item C3. Move to pass Councilor's Bill number four. Councilor Emmons. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor's Bill number four on first reading, appropriating the Adams County Open Space Grant Funds for the Squires Park Renovation and the Kay Lake Area Management Plan Implementation Projects, not to exceed one. 1,900,000 in expenses into the Parks, Open Space, and Trails Post Fund. Councilor Seymour? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill number four. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Seymour? Yes. Councilor Baker? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott? Yes. Councilor Emmons? Yes. Councilor Azadi? Yes. And Mayor McNally? Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item D, um, passing D1. Councilor Emmons. I move to authorize the city manager to execute two grade crossing construction and maintenance agreements with Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway Company for the construction of railroad improvements necessary to establish quiet zones at Lowell Boulevard and Bradburn Boulevard. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass uh, item D1. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott? Yes. Councillor Emmons? Yes. Councillor Azadi? Yes. Mayor McNally? Yes. And Councillor Seymour? Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item D2. Councillor Emmons? Thank you, Mayor. I move to authorize a payment to Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway Company in the amount of $855,889 for billable costs and fees as outlined in the agreements and authorize a contingency in the amount of $85,000 for a total project cost not to exceed $940,889. Mayor Pro Tem? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass uh, item D2. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott? Yes. Councillor Emmons? Yes. Councillor Azadi? Yes. Mayor McNally? Yes. Councillor Seymour? Yes. And Councillor Baker? Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. That brings us to item E Colorado Legal Services and an Adams County Program Intergovernmental Agreement. Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mayor. I move to authorize the city manager to enter into an intergovernmental agreement between Adams County Colorado Legal Services, the cities of Westminster, Thornton, Federal Heights, Brighton, Commerce City, Aurora, North Glen, and the city and county of Broomfield regarding contributions toward the continuation of the landlord tenant legal services program. Councilor Emmons? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass item eight or 10 E one. Any further discussion? Oh, Councilor Baker? Yes, I'd like to delve into this a little further than was in the thing. It was my impression that this is an even-handed measure to try to resolve disputes between landlords and tenants. And uh, uh, it's not biased against landlords. So do we have someone here who could speak to that, city manager? City attorney is available and ready to speak to it. Sure, uh, thank you, Manager Freitag. Dave Frankel, city attorney. Um, um, I think Councillor Baker, the the question of the nature of the representation that's provided, uh, it's intended to be landlord tenant legal advice for uh, those that qualify. They would be low income um, residents of the city of Westminster who have landlord tenant uh, questions 
that are in need of legal services. So, so backing up, uh, Colorado Legal Services um, provides these types of uh, uh, services around the state. And uh, some four plus years ago, Westminster and other Adams County jurisdictions um, created this agreement as an effort to increase the level of service for our residents. And so we've provided the Irving Street Library uh, regular hours so that people can come in and get uh, their questions answered. Um, and uh, we've also increased the staffing levels of Colorado Legal Services through the uh, contributions of all the different municipalities in Adams County. Um, our Jefferson County residents are able to access these same services through the Denver office of Colorado Legal Services. Obviously, um, evictions uh, are filed in county court. So depending on the county that you live in, the court's either up in Brighton or out in Golden. So uh, they're not the same attorneys uh, representing both because of the travel time is my understanding. They have dedicated attorneys for each of those uh, county courts. The uh, goal of um, providing these services is to ensure that um, the hopefully the, the disputes are resolved, that the rent, if it's an unpaid rent scenario, that the rent gets paid and that the tenants don't lose their housing. The, the concern is that um, having an eviction on their records makes it more difficult to rent their next apartment. And so if there's a way to resolve the dispute with the landlord by paying the, the back due rent or um, entering into an agreement, where uh, the case would be dismissed and the ten tenant just seeks housing elsewhere is viewed as, I think, a favorable result that allows people to continue to have housing. So I don't know that the, the services are um, described as biased one way or another, but they are intended to um, prevent homelessness for low-income residents of our city. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, just to further clarify and make sure that I don't misspeak, remembering back when we started this, it also um, helps avoid uh, predatory practices on people who might not otherwise be able to ask questions of uh, legal nature when it comes to uh, rent agreements. Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem, I, my understanding is that yes, Colorado Legal Services will also uh, help tenants understand the terms of their leases and they have access to interpretation services where all languages uh, they can access interpreters to facilitate communication with um, residents whose primary language is not English. So yeah, they, they are um, providing all of those services. And I think it's two days a week at the Irving Street Library. Uh, residents of Westminster are uh, invited to uh, go and access these services. And uh, if not, you can I believe call Colorado legal services and schedule an appointment uh, and they're available that way as well great thank you um with with that because uh, as i recollect when we did this originally we were talking about just adams county and staff was able to work on increasing this to the whole city of westminster which was important to me if we were going to provide this kind of service um, but we certainly have i know uh counselor azadi speaks often of these kind of problems as well as we've had residents come and talk about predatory practices with landlords so I think this is an important service and I'm glad to see that it's actually being utilized because um, that was one of the other questions when we first started talking about this. I think it's probably four years ago. Um, so either way, I'll be supporting this tonight and I appreciate um, you providing the context for us. Roll call, please. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-0 vote. Thank you. And it is now 814 and this meeting will be closed and we will now convene the WIDA board meeting, incorporating the role from the past meeting. Uh, could we have a roll call, please? Board member Baker. Just here? What, what? Yeah, yeah. Here. Um, Vice Chair DeMott. Here. Uh, board member Emmons. Present. Board member Azadi. Here. Uh, Chair McNally. Here. Um, board member Nermella. And board member Seymour. Question. Here. Do we need to um, make a motion to excuse Councillor Nermella on this one? 
chair. I, I see no harm in doing so, although I don't uh, believe that the WIDA um, rules have the same applicability as to missed meetings triggering um, problems the same way that the city charter would for a sitting city councilor missing a meeting, but certainly no harm in uh, voting to excuse uh, board member Nirmala for her absence tonight. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, with that, I'll move to excuse councilor Nirmala this evening. Councilor Seymour. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to excuse councilor Nirmala due to illness um, from tonight's WIDA meeting. There's no other discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Minutes, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to approve the minutes of the December 19th, 2022 meeting as presented. Councilor, uh, Board Member Seymour. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the minutes from December 19th as presented. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. This is a voice vote. Oh, I'm sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That brings us to item 8A, Mayor uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the Executive Director to enter into agreement with Kutek Rock LLP for commercial real estate litigation and services related to the downtown Westminster project and the amount not to exceed $150,000. Um, board Member Seymour? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass item 3A1. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Board Member Baker. Yes. Vice Chair DeMott. Yes. Board Member Emmons. Yes. Board Member Azadi. Yes. Chairperson McNally. Yes. And Board Member Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 0 vote. It is 8 17, and we adjourn the meeting and we'll go into post meeting where we have a presentation. We'll take a five minute break in between.
had more than three minutes. Okay. Welcome everyone. We are in post meeting and we're going to have a wonderful presentation about some little beasts. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors. Uh, presentation on the Emerald Ash Borer as it arrives in Westminster and um, kind of what the effects are going to be. And so, City Forest. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Emerald Ash Borer, as was mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so some key points I want everybody to take home are that we are dealing with the largest urban tree disaster in the United States history. Most people are familiar with Dutch elm disease. EAD is 37 times more destructive than Dutch elm disease was. There's about 8 billion ash trees in North America. Um, it's here, it's in the city, it's spreading, um, but it is not too late to take decisive action to preserve one of these trees or at least slow it down. My team, the city forestry team, only manages about 2% of those ash in the city. That other 98% are on private property or they're the responsibility of private property owners. Um, so we're going to be facing some significant environmental and economic uh, impacts to the organization, to the citizens, and, and our small businesses here and large businesses. Um, so please think about what can we do to help preserve some of these prop private property ash so that we don't have all of this devastation occurring within a very short period of time. Next slide, please. So about one out of seven trees in the city is in ash. That comes to about 70,000 at least. This is an estimation from the uh, Colorado State Forest Service. Um, this issue is not unique to Westminster alone. All communities along the Front Range have a very high concentration of ash. In fact, there's about one and a half million ash in the Denver Metro alone. I mentioned that one in seven trees is in ash in our city. However, that concentrate, it's not evenly distributed. So there's certain areas that are 100% uh, ash. Like every tree you see in these photos is in ash. Um, looking down on Torrey Peaks neighborhood, on that street in that particular uh, neighborhood and several other ones in that, in that area, that's 100% of the trees are ash in everybody's front yard. And I walked the promenade, that street right there, Mr. Gibbs walk and yeah, it, it's beautiful along there. I mean, I can see why people planted so heavily. They're beautiful trees. They were great here for a long oh, time. Oh, you guys planted them. The city did. That's all. Op our that's our space for um, green space. And then behind that is all of our um, evergreen trees that are dying. Um, but I don't want to misrepresent this. Not every area in the city looks like this. However, a lot of areas do, and there are a lot of ash trees out there. And I sincerely wish I could show you what ash trees look like and show you how prevalent they are in the community because there are parking lots. That's the only tree in a parking lot is, you know, completely ash. Next slide, please. Um, we know from research and from experience in the Midwest and parts of the East Coast where EAB has already uh, come through that the majority of tree uh, mortality occurs between years four through eight of an infestation. We're in year four right now. Um, so I'm seeing some dead trees. I'm expecting to see quite a few more. Um, again, it's not too late to take action to, to stop some of this, uh, this scenery that you see in these photos. Something to know about trees that are killed by emerald ash borer as well. They uh, become dangerous more quickly than your average dead tree does. They get so dehydrated by this insect that they can uproot, they can start dropping limbs onto houses, roadway sidewalks, neighboring properties. So my team and code enforcement are gonna be really occupied with this for coming years. They need to come down quickly, in other words. Next slide, please. Uh, there's gonna be very significant economic impact to our property owners. Uh, these numbers that you see up there, they look wild. It's kind of hard to believe that, but um, they're very generalized because there's so many variables that go into the cost of a tree removal, such as you know location or proximity to houses, power lines, things like that. Um, but I think we're lucky if we can convince people to preserve half of the ash in the city. And even with that, we're looking at tens of millions of dollars. Um, this photo on the, on the right that you see there is an example of what could happen. This is directly across the street from City Hall here on the other side of City Civic Center Park or Peter Pan Park, um, that apartment complex. I was called to go out and check a suspected EAD tree. 
I got there, I found they almost had no tree diversity on that property at all. Every single tree that was a shade tree was an ash and they were either dead or dying. And when I talked to that property manager, they mentioned that they had received quotes up in upwards of $200,000 just to remove the trees. So when you factor in stump grinding, tree replacements, things like that, you're looking at about a half million dollars on that one property. Um, when EAV first came to the United States, there were no treatment options available. Uh, things are different now. We have very effective uh, treatments that are up to 98% effective in some cases. So we're encouraging the public to have their trees evaluated by a private tree care company. And if they're in good enough condition and they can afford it, yes, preserve your tree if, if that's what you want to do. Um, if that tree is not in good enough condition to treat, we're encouraging people to remove them because we're in a treat them and preserve them or remove them scenario here. Uh, again, because the longer you wait to remove that poor quality tree, the more expensive it gets and the more dangerous it gets. <coughs> Can you talk more about the insect? Sure. So it's not the um, adult insect that causes the damage. They actually lay eggs in the tree, and then when those eggs turn into a larva, they start chewing around underneath the bark. And that's actually what kills uh, the tree because it stops the flow of water and nutrients. So it's the larva that does it. What do they look like? What are and the little worms? The, or the, sorry, the larva look like little worms. The adults are actually kind of a metallic, kind of beautiful beetle, unfortunately, um, but they're devastating. How quickly does it take for one tree to get infected and go down? It can be about two to three years in some cases. And that's one particularly challenging thing about this insect is that it can be in a tree and you don't even know it. You don't see any symptoms of it until two to three years later. And that's how it spreads so effectively. And is there a reason why it's spreading so much now? It, it just arrived in Boulder in, I think, 2014, and it's kind of worked its way up and down the front range. Naturally, it moves about two to three miles a year, it can fly. Um, but humans, that's how it's moved throughout North America so rapidly, is people move firewood and things like that. And the larva is inside that wood. Hmm. Next slide, please. So PRNL, we're doing a few different things to address EAB. We've been doing some stuff for several years and trying to bring awareness, but this spring we have a more comprehensive uh, messaging campaign going out to the public. Our PRL marketing team is fantastic. They're going to be leading the charge on that. We've also got our urban forest management plan that is uh, the contract is secured. We're going to be start working on that. It's going to take about a year to complete. However, um, some very quick turnaround deliverables are EAB related issues, such as looking at our tree ordinances again, because we know that some things need to be clarified in there. Um, we've also got a right-of-way tree inventory process taking place right now, it's a project. Um, City of Westminster is a little unique in that right-of-way trees, the responsibility falls on adjacent property owners. However, most people don't know that. Um, and so we've never really pushed out messaging informing people of that. So we don't even know what trees are there, how many ash trees there are. So we've got a contractor going around inventorying those trees and there's estimated to be about 20,000 trees in the right of way um, and a very high concentration of more ash which is about 20 percent uh, next slide please and as you all heard about just a little bit ago and to clarify maybe a few points um, we know that it's going to be very costly to deal with EAB in the city any grant opportunity that we have I want to pursue uh, to help bring relief to our residents. And this is largely what's driving this, uh, this green infrastructure uh, push. So I thank you all for considering that earlier in the evening. With that, I'm happy to hop in any questions you may have. Councilor Baker. How does this compare to the pine beetles? It's uh, a bigger problem um, because pines generally, you know, they exist naturally in the mountains for the most part here in Colorado. Um, EAB was, you know, naturally found throughout the East Coast and certain parts of the Midwest. So it's just a much bigger problem. And it's also invasive. Uh, mountain pine beetles pretty much always been here. It comes and goes. Uh, our uh, you know, hard freezes used to kind of control it. Mountain pine beetle, that's not the case with EAB. Um, so they can just burrow deeper and survive these cold temps. So it's much more widespread. 
Kelly, how does this compare to Dutch Elm? Because if you go back in time, 40, 50 years in Denver, Elm was a dominant tree. Right? You're right. And uh, EAB is just in the number of trees affected, 37 times more destructive than Dutch Elm was. That's, that's a big deal. Dutch Elm devastated uh, various communities. I don't know, I wasn't here in Westminster at that time. I don't think we had that huge uh, Elm population like some other communities have in, in the front range, um, but it's, it's devastating. Ash is a very widely used tree. Um, in fact, I think I used too much. Is there a tree that is more insect proof than others? Uh, for types of ash or just trees in general? Yep, this insect only affects ash trees, um, which is a good thing. However, there's a ton of ash trees out there. Um, so th we're making some recommendation, replacement recommendations, things like that. You can find uh, an updated list on our forestry webpage for the public or for anybody to, to look at. Uh, so basically, how much how much money from these grants do you think we can achieve? It's hard to tell right now. I know with the uh, IRA um, Act that there's about one and a half billion is what I'm hearing uh, for the whole United States. Uh, gonna, that's going to be available for um, you know local governments. Now, I, it doesn't outright say it's going to be available for EAB specifically. Um, it's more geared towards green infrastructure and improving canopies and, and you know, lower income uh, areas and stuff like that, which certainly applies. And EAB is only going to worsen that situation. So I think it can apply to that. Okay. And uh, do we think naturally there will be a certain really survival rate in ash? Has that been the experience in other parts of the country? Not at all yet. Yeah, it's 100% fatal to all ash trees. And if we can find an ash tree that survives it, you'll have every nursery person here trying to you know, take seeds from that tree because that'll be a tree that can uh, be extremely valuable in the future. But no, it's 100% fatal to all ash. So, you know, we can preserve some of them as long as people are willing or want to, really. And, and there's a few different ways to approach treatment options. One, yes, if you've got an ash tree and you want to keep it forever and you can afford to treat it every three years, Great, go ahead and do it. Another way to use EAB treatments is to just slow down, like I said, that rate of ash mortality so we don't have to deal with 70,000 dead trees all at one time. We can slowly ease off of our dependence on, on ash trees. If that, if that answers your question. I've gotten a couple of emails just saying this is all hoax and not true and why are we taking all these things out? And I don't know where they're getting their information because I, watched you all take stuff down but, and uh, watch some of the trees that are bad. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. And, you, and all you have to do is look in the Midwest and East Coast and you can see you know, every community that has ash that's had EAB come through has dealt with this. And I, I believe you dealt with it a little bit in, in Wisconsin. Yes, uh, and so um, it was devastating to the community. Um, so Janesville, you know, 50 plus years ago used to be known as the power city because they had uh, elm trees that you know had grown up and over uh, the streets and so you had these tunnels very very proud of that as a community Dutch elm came through wiped those out so what did the city do in the community they came in and planted this ash tree throughout and replaced all of those elm trees and so um, and starting in about 2012 um, the ash trees started dying and between 2012 and 2019 you know, all of our ash trees died with the exception of those that were treated, those that were treated by the city or those that were treated by um, property owners. Um, and we had a program where our city forester, you know, would roll and trained, you know, parks employees because, you know, it, it took the team. But they'd go around because people just didn't realize, one, that they had an ash tree or two, that they had an ash tree that was starting to show signs of, of dying. And typically they'll start dying from the top down. You'll see the canopy. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll see that canopy start to lose its leaves and it just moves down the entire uh, tree. And so it changed the urban tree landscape, if you will, of our community. It did. I mean, it's for real. Um, and it's, um, the, I think the treatment has actually gotten better. 
um, you know, over the past uh, several years, but in those early days, 2012, 2015, there weren't a lot of really good options and those that were there were quite expensive. So it's a, um, it's for real, um, it's coming, it's here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are things that we can do to mitigate, um, but there's not enough money in, you know, in the, uh, what are we calling this uh, act, the uh, um, Inflation Reduction Act? You know, there's not enough money in that to, to take care of the problems that are across the nation. So, you know, we'll be able to do what little we can do. Treatment? Yes, and, and the, the most effective treatment method is actually a micro injection where you drill holes around the tree and you inject a very little amount of pesticide directly into the tree, which is favorable so you're not out there spraying entire canopies and injecting you know, uh, anything. But yeah, yep, there's plenty of that. What percent infestation are we at? Like, and I would think 2015 we were at zero or one percent. Like, what? Over time, like, what does that look like? It's hard to, it's not an exact number, but I think we're at probably 10, 10% or so. Still fairly early age, for early days, but um, again, with that two to three year incubation period, so to speak, we're further along than we can actually see right now. Okay, so we, we it came to Western Center in about 2019. Exactly. And so we've increased about, what, 2%-ish every year? Yeah, and what's alarming is that, I'm, you know, Initially, when it was first found in the city of Westminster, it was directly across the street from where it was found in Broomfield, which is up on uh, like here on 144th or approximately. Um, since then, it's been found in Arvada and confirmed in Thornton just last summer, and then across the street here from City Hall. So it's basically on all sides. Um, it doesn't mean that every tree has that at all, but it's it's it has spread. So, what are you needing from council? other than what we voted on tonight. Um, because what I don't want is to incite, because that sounds feel fearful. <laughs> I don't want to incite that, but like, how do we approach that with reality that, you know, this is happening. It's, this is what we're tracking. And um, you know, I, I'd like to see a little bit more of that, of how we're communicating that, because this is like, the mayor said we've been talking about this for years but i don't think that it's it's one of those things where i read it i'm like yeah yeah and like toss it um because i'm not as close to the information as you are and i don't feel it's as dire as i just don't feel like and that's me personally right like until i've been in this kind of presentation i didn't quite understand just the aspects and how quickly it can spread and so, but not every, not every resident is listening to this <laughs> study session. Exactly, so. and, and that's not uncommon. I mean, I think it's, it, there was some message exhaustion going on with it because people have been talking about it since 2014 when it was found in Boulder, and I get it. Um, just until you start seeing it, that's when it really starts to hit home. And then, like I said, I wish I could show you how many ash are out there. Like I just, pro when I drive around the city, I just process, like I'm looking at trees, I'm thinking about species condition that just every single tree and they are all over the place. Um, so it is really going to be a, be a widespread problem. Mr. Bates. So what's the long game? Are we going to abandon all ash trees? Do we have a plan where we say we're going to encourage any tree less than eight inches in really circumference to be cut down and replaced now? Do we have some kind of Long game. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, for the publicly owned, publicly managed trees that, that my team is responsible for, we've, we've cut our ash tree population in half almost in the last five years, um, just because we're taking out those poor conditioned trees. So we can see ourselves eventually, like, like I mentioned, kind of weaning off of them and kind of minimizing that, that, that big burst of expense all at once. So eventually, we have to let some of these go or other ailments will take care of some of these trees and they'll make that decision fairly easy. Um, for example, like on our median trees, cars come up and hit the trees, things like that, or other insect issues, drought issues, irrigation issues, things like that. So we'll eventually won't have a whole lot of them left. Well, from basically what you're saying, we won't have any left. Eventually. It, I mean, we're looking at 
potentially the slow extinction of a species. And then we're trying to slow down the rate of that extinction so we don't have to have a lot of things like that. So what I'm asking you, is there something the city could do proactively? Like, could we uh, recommend to homeowners that if they have small ash trees, okay, they get cut out and then maybe we can buy uh, a whole bunch of trees as a giveaway or something to like really facilitate that exchange? I'm open for all of those suggestions, yeah. And I think a lot of this information can come out in the spring right after we have more. If I may um, address that, uh, Councillor, the, uh, really what we're looking at is, you know, exactly. that's not a fun no, option, but it's a good one. Um, but the idea is to really try to identify the, the best specimens that are out there. And Brian's already done that with the trees that we manage and try to make sure that as many of those high quality trees are preserved for as long as we can so that it becomes a, a slow decline as opposed to what happened across the street where they had this massive die off and so expensive and ugly uh, to deal with. So really, uh, we're also looking at those right of way trees uh, where there's about 4,000 trees that are ash in the right of way. And I think that would be a good place for us to start some of this triage uh, because they're accessible. Um, we could get at them quickly. I guess uh, the current municipal code allows us to uh, address issues with those trees um, quickly. So that might be a place to start. Here, counselors. Just something else I think that we're going to have to take in, into consideration is exactly what, you know, uh, happened in communities like Janesville where Dutch elm disease, you know, died off, killed off those trees. And then they replaced with one singular species, if you will, ash trees. And here we are, you know, 20, 30 years later, and you've got the ash trees. I think it's going to be important to really be very, very selective and proactive in a, diversifying that canopy, that urban forest um, with a, a variety of different trees. So we're not, you know, just coming in and replacing with one particular species or two particular species. Cause you know, if history repeats itself, you know, give it another 30, 40, 50 years and we could be in the same sort of situation with something else. So yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. And we were just thinking about this beforehand. I'm adamant and passionate about diversifying our trees because I, I want to break that cycle and I don't want you know round three of the same sort of thing happening here again at all. So really working hard on that. Historic Westminster, we had something there on Bradburn that they had to take a bunch of trees down and with what you said, they didn't realize they were responsible for, because there's a sidewalk, then there's this little piece where the trees are, and it was $2,000, I remember, for one um, family, and they couldn't afford it. So how do we engage community that knows how to take down trees and would help with people that can't afford it so that we can get rid of the trees and get a new one started, but people don't have that kind of cost. So how do we get the volunteers engaged to help with this mess? I think part of the solution comes from philanthropy and the Westminster Legacy Foundation has targeted EAB as something to raise money for, to support, uh, especially members of the community that can't afford to deal with this very expensive, potentially very expensive problem. Um, Mayor Perkin. I was just going to point out that you were talking about outreach. I know the Environmental Advisory Board has been doing a lot of outreach on this. They did a, <clears throat> they had a, a tent at uh, Westy Fest that was super well attended. Every time I went over there, they had people over there talking to them. So I don't know if anybody had seen their presentation, but this has kind of been the thing they've really been working on. Same acronym. I know it kept throwing me off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> like they're dangerous now? <laughs> <laughs> Only if they're unleashed. <laughs> Anybody else want that position? <laughs> Councillor Seymour. Uh, to, I'll bring up the uh, Parks Rec Library Open Space Board has had this discussion for over a year now, at least to as, as far as uh, some funds that have been set aside for other projects that have not been used as far as um, HOA projects or those kind of things that have not been um, fulfilled that. So they have that budget for that. 
and they've been they've been having that discussion and I'm, it's been every every meeting now on on how to uh, have funds available to allocate for um, tree treatments so they're working on that process and mayor and councilors um, I think it's also important that we really um, spend some time thinking about as we apply for grants you know uh, are those grants to um, you know treat trees you have the money used to treat trees and prolong the the life of those trees or is the money used to you know essentially remove trees grind down stumps and plant new and so you know that's another reason why um, you know being able to apply for those grants is so important um, and then the other thing I think is worthwhile is our website does you know list currently you know uh, diversified listing of um, trees that you know could be planted and do well certainly in this area if any other questions come up please don't hesitate to reach out through whatever the appropriate channels are but I'm, I'm happy I'm, I'm here for I'm here to answer questions so anytime I have answered it but whatever we take out do we we replace on public on public property yeah as much as possible okay. um, as long as the, it's a suitable planting location and we primarily prefer to plant in irrigated areas that are um, you know, receive adequate irrigation because that aftercare when you plant a tree like going back and watering it making sure that it's receiving adequate water that's the majority of the cost of a tree replacement that gets overlooked actually oftentimes um, especially here in Colorado so we're very adamant about that and I think you could I often wonder for the 100th anniversary we planted 100 trees down in Big Dry Creek across the street from the park at 128 I often wonder how if any of those trees survived Tough spot. Um, it was out in the open space. Planted several. So yeah, we generally, if we're planting on the open spaces, we prefer to have a, like a water source, a waterway, something like a creek or a pond, or some kind of natural occurring water source. Yeah, I could take a look. Get back to you. We planted a bunch. <laughs> we planted a bunch of trees on Little Dry Creek uh, this summer with uh, upward bound youth from the Westminster High School. And I just checked them last weekend, and they look like they're all doing great. Yep, and, and again, that kind of speaks to uh, aftercare. You know, our, our team's out there checking on them. Oh, they, they had weekly. every tree was buttoned down, and yeah, good job. <laughs> and we did the same thing along that. And it was Lowe's, I think, that gave us all the money to plant all those trees. But we had um, scouts out there. We had families with I don't know how many generations that we took a couple of pictures. Yeah, I'm sorry to give you this news. I know it's, yeah, I wish it was better. Okay. Well, rally the troops and help everybody out and get the kinds of trees that grow in the desert and <laughs> don't <laughs> like pests. <laughs> Tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay, it's 8.55 and we're done and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Oh, we start thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm late. 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 I'm late.